Today the topic is uh, augmented OLAP for big data. OLAP here means uh, online analytics processing. So we'll be talking about when uh, online analytics meets big data, what's the problem, uh, what we think uh, is not working right, and how we think the right way to solve the problem. Um, agenda a little bit, uh, I will talk about uh, the company, uh, the startup, uh, challenges a little bit, and then jump to the pain points we see in big data analytics, and then present the uh, solution we think, which is uh, augmented OLAP. We will talk about the idea and also a video demo to show you how it works in real, and a little bit benchmark to see uh, whether the technology is right in the future. Lastly, a wrap up with a use case. So a little bit about uh, challenges. I will try to be brief. Um, so it is uh, killing plus intelligence, two, we, two words combined together. Then we need to understand a little bit about killing first. So this is a uh, Apache killing is a extreme multi-dimensional OLAP engine for big data. So it was uh, firstly created in eBay and later contributed to ASF. I believe it is right now still the, pop the most popular um, big data OLAP engine out there. So if you Google big data OLAP, I believe uh, our project killing is the first result. I've just checked it. Um, also, if you Google Hadoop OLAP, it is still the first uh, result. Okay? So that shows the popularity of the technology. I, we believe it has more than uh, 1,000 serious adoptions worldwide. And because Apache Gearing did pretty well, um, and we think it is heading the right direction, so the guy uh, firstly worked in Apache Gearing, goes out and founded a startup, which uh, is the company I'm now working for, Kylie Jeans. Um, in Chinese, because the Kiling is a mythic animal, it, the, 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 the pronunciation is Qiling, uh, so we used to pronounce it Qiling or Qiling jeans, but here we pronounce it uh, Qiling jeans, that's perfect as well. It sounds more uh, international, okay. Um, so Qiling jeans is founded in 2016 uh, by the team who uh, created Apache Qiling. The company is recognized by a CRN as top 10 big data startup 2018. Our VC is pretty good, uh, Redpoint, Cisco, CBC Capital, Shunwei, 8 Road, which is a branch of uh, Fidelity, and uh, just yesterday we closed our Series C, uh, which is by uh, Code Tour. Okay, so much uh, for the company. Um, many of our customers are very big giants. Uh, it's really an owner thinking we are a small startup and the companies trust us and put money in our, in our product. Um, this industry covers telecom, finance, retail, etc. So uh, the product works for big companies. And uh, we have global partners when solving customer problems, solutions, providing solutions, we are not alone. So we partner with uh, Microsoft, we are Microsoft global gold partner. We work well with Azure, Mapar, Hortonworks, Cloudera. We are Tableau's tech technology partner, and so on. So uh, if any technology you are using today and you are facing the problem I'm going to mention, uh, maybe we can help you. Okay, go into the pain points. We think, uh, is uh, where it is right now in the big data analytics. So the common observation is my, why my report is so slow now? Because when it dates back, the data volume is small, it's blazing fast, so smooth. And right now, we have a big conflict, which is the fast and the changing analytics demand versus the slow and heavy big data operations. So that's why your report is slower and slower because you've got more and more data, right? And that is especially true in China. For example, uh, we have uh, maybe 1.3 billions of people in China. And uh, the union pay, which is the China card company, 
has a record of almost 10 billion card IDs in their database. And think about so many cards, the transactions, processings. If you analyze that, what will be the performance? So that's the problem. So how to solve the problem? A typical approach we see right now is throwing some people, okay? Um, we have the concept of data lake, where data is more in raw form, and we do some ETL to move the data into a data warehouse where the data is clean and more organized, structured. And finally, we do another round of perhaps ETL to move the data into where some, some we'll call data mart, where data is prepared and canned, which can be consumed by the uh, BI tool or visualizing tool easily. So with all this um, development process done, now the data could be faster and match what the business user or what the analyst, analyst, analyst uh, wants. But once you have done this, it's perhaps weeks gone. They may have a new idea. Uh, they may want to explore in a new direction. Then that's a new round of development. So that is the problem we see everywhere, I think, uh, early in eBay or in other big companies we work with in China and also in the US. So this approach has a high cost of time and money. Now, if we zoom out a little bit, looking more from the architecture point of view, I want to say that this approach is not only expensive, but maybe not applicable in the long term. Let's see. First, the time to value is very slow, right? Take weeks waiting for a new report, breaks the promise, which is online. We say OLAP, it means online analytics. I don't want to wait for weeks doing things offline. Second, the collaboration fails. So like the chart, you would see in a big enterprise, every team is forming their own force to fight their own path, connect visualization to the big data. So you have all the lines, right? And each line is a team working behind. Say, I want to have a tax rule applied consistently across the company, which is very common. How can I do that? If I have two or three people working on one thing, collaboration is easy. But now we are talking about maybe 10 or 20 teams from different departments working on different data movements and they want to a consistent, maybe a, a consistency in measures, in dimensions. It's very difficult to achieve if, um, if you're looking from a management perspective. So finally, if we can even bear with the time to value, the collaboration pain, we manage that. I think that's not scalable for business. Why not scalable? Because you need people. You on the teams, need all the people to staff the work. If you can do one report in, in one team, now, for example, some China regulatory requires four or 500 reports just to let you be able to do some finance business. How would you support that? I would say that's not doable by this approach. Okay. So that's the problem we see. Um, so we figure out we should be taking the problem in another way, which we call it augmented OLAP. So instead of throwing people, we think we should throw in some intelligence, just as the name of the company indicates. So the idea is all the work we use to be done by people should be done by a system. So the system should be able to transparently accelerate the queries. So as they see coming from the visualization layer and sitting between the visualization and big data, the system do on-demand data preparations. It says, hey, this kind of analytics is needed, so I will prepare data for this need. 
And this happens transparently. And the result should be an interactive query experience for the end user. That is, the business user or the analyst sitting in front of a BI tool like Excel or Tabula, he should feel just smooth, right? All the things, magic happens behind the scene. And it also gives high concurrency, ideally. So with this approach, we removed people. All the system could be managed by one or two administrators. Then we had a chance to do centralizations. So uh, the tax roof example I just mentioned will be easily managed here. You can have calculated measures, calculated dimensions, and they will be defined in a central place and will serve across the whole enterprise. So this way, we, should, we will be able to achieve faster time to market, and now the result is a system that stays online, right? So that kind of brings the OLAP, the online promise, back to the user in the big data era. Now let's look in a different way, maybe one level deeper. So from end user, his perspective should be like this, right? Compared to the traditional long workflow, which is at the right bottom, we should only have what uh, two interactors, right? The user and the BI tool. All the user has to carry is using the BI tool as it, he would used to be. Stays online. And all the magic happens behind. The rest is fully automated, not be worried by the users. So in the middle, we think this should be an augmented OLAP engine. What the engine do? It listens to the BI tool. All the queries came in. It will analyze, detect the query patterns inside. So let's say I will do monthly report. I will do daily report. I will do yearly report. OK, the engine will tell they are all time dimensional report. So they have a similarity. So this is here the pattern refers to. And collect all the patterns, the engine will be able to form a, a data model, or more precisely, a pre-calculation model. For people who know uh, Apache Killing or a previous our product, uh, the Backend technology is still an evolution of renovated cube technology. But here, the concept is not anymore bothering our end user. He just views everything will be accelerated automatically, no matter underlying it's a cube, it's an index, or whatever. So have the automated created model. The engine will do data preparation from the raw data process the data, and become some prepared data. Now, the BI tool will be answered not from the raw data anymore once it is prepared. It will, from the, it will be the prepared data from which uh, the final result of a query will be generated. And depends on the level of how much the preparation is done, the, the query can be accelerated from 10 to 20 times or even higher. Depends on the kind of query, the complexity of the query. So that is the idea. In another way. Okay, so next I would like to show you a demo, uh, which is our latest product, Killinger's Enterprise version 4. It's still in beta stage, but it's ready to uh, have a video demo at this stage. So what are you going to see is uh, we'll use a sales record, which is from TPCH benchmark. It has a billion rows. And uh, we'll see a user using Tabula try to analyze the data set. The, at the back end, we'll have uh, Spark SQL 2.4 as the raw data, and the uh, Killing Enterprise setting on top of that. So that's the setup. Okay, let me try to play the video. I guess it's playing. Oh, yes. So um, 
Here you see the familiar tabula, and we have a user trying to analyze the revenue, okay? So first, he is creating a calculate revenue uh, measure. And from that, we'll, he will do uh, annual growth rate, uh, a typical analysis. Um, at the beginning, the system has no knowledge of the queries. So the query now is hitting Spark SQL. But this is also the time the system is learning. Learning the user's behaviors, the patterns. However, here the learning is ongoing, so the Spark SQL will be very slow to react. Like every query lasts about uh, 10 seconds or more. So here it is loading the revenue data by year. So that's the curve. We have, uh, yeah, six, seven years. Remove the last half year to make six full year record. And doing a uh, year by year comparison. So that's the annual growth, uh, growth rate. And you may wonder, oh, the curve is so strange. I need to analyze one level deeper. So that's the typical drill down operation. So we can drill down by brand. Yeah, drag and drop. So it will last another 10 seconds or something to run. Not accelerated yet. Yeah, so that's the result. So that's the um, used to be user experience, which is not very pleasure. So this is a report produced by Tabula saying what the time of the queries took uh, to execute. That's about 10 seconds each. And now we are shifting to another angle that is inside the Killinger's enterprise. Is there a way to pause it? No? Okay. So what you're seeing is the system is having, is looking at a bunch of queries need to be accelerated. And the administrator's work is just click one button. Okay, let's accelerate. And there's a backend job running. Uh, it runs fast, it's already finished. Um, in our environment, it finished in um, four, three minutes to accelerate one billion rows. And now after four minutes, we go back to Tabula to see the user experience again. So simply, basically, redo the annual growth, growth rate analytics. And now you can see that all the interactions are almost instantly. So this is the online behavior we think should be presented to our end user. No more wait for uh, weeks of development. All the acceleration happens in just a few minutes. Given the right tool, we can achieve that. So finally, this is the, again, tabular report for the uh, new interactions. As you can see, most of the queries runs under one second. Okay. Oh, in that experiment, we put on six physical nodes um, as a cluster. It runs both Hadoop and also the Killinger's Enterprise. Six physical nodes. Uh, I cannot recall the exact spec, but I believe it's maybe 40 cores, V cores. How, how do I go to the next page, actually? This one? Okay, okay. Um, yes, any questions? Um, a common ask questions asked would, about the demo will be, how about the first slow exploration experience? Is there any way to improve that? And the answer is yes, because uh, in reality, uh, we would warm up the system by learning um, query histories, which usually can be provided by database admins. 
for example, you would be using Spark SQL or Hive, uh, the DB, the database administrator should be able to grab a bunch of logs to you that represents what the enterprise analyst currently is analyzing. And the system can learn from that to extract current patterns, such that uh, the first slow exploration will not be that suffering. And uh, what if the analyst operates differently the second time? That's also a common question. And the answer is um, the intelligent data preparation is not based on exact queries because it's not a simple cache like that. Underlying it, it is a by dimension, by measure prepared data. So it's still coming from the cube theory. So as long as the need is the same. Here the need is annual growth, growth rate analysis. So as long as the user is looking at the data from a time dimension, from a product brand dimension, he will be benefited by the preparation. So how the operate, how the interaction goes actually does not matter. What matters is the pattern that user is analyzing the data. And we, will be, and we believe that the pattern is pretty stable because you have your business model is pretty stable. Overall, your data structure is mostly stable. And uh, the dimensions you're looking at the data will be pretty stable. It's time dimension, product dimension, geo dimension, right? Okay, now, sorry? Management module, uh, yes, we have. It comes with a what we call a, a kind of manager, something like Cloud Air Manager that manages the uh, cluster service for you. Yeah. You mean the kind of manager? Yeah. It sits besides the cluster. Usually, it could be on the edge node or in the inside cluster is okay as well. Yeah. I mean the calendar manager, the hardware consumption? Yeah. Uh, no, it's very minimal. Just a monitor or manager so node. The data, data node services in the worker. The workers, what? I didn't get the question, sorry. You mentioned the, uh, using eight, uh, for Um, the six servers are managed firstly by Hadoop because, uh, yeah, we sit on top of a Hadoop system at the moment and we dispatch jobs to, for example, the data preparation job is dispatched to the Hadoop cluster to calculate. Yeah, yeah we can use that at the moment, yeah, yeah. Cool. Um, finally, uh, some may ask, what level of performance improvement you can achieve? Is there a more comprehensive or performance benchmark like that? Yes, and, and we have one, and I'm going to show you. So we have the TPCH benchmark running on uh, Kinegen's Enterprise 4 beta. Um, just in case you're not familiar, um, TPCH is a uh, well-known decision-making benchmark. So it, Composites of 22 decision making queries, which scans large volume of data. It's highly complex queries and answers real critical business questions. So, just for one example, uh, there is a query in TPCH which is shipping priority query that retrieves the shipping priority and the potential revenue of the orders having the largest revenue among those that had not been shipped as of a given date. And the query asks for 10, top 10 orders with the highest revenue. So that's where you're making decision if any of the shipment cannot make, which one you're going to sacrifice, maybe by the revenue. And on the right is the data schema. We're pretty complicated, so although it 
only has 22 queries, but they are all serious, complex queries. So we are comparing uh, KE4 versus uh, Spark SQL 2.4. As you see, we use three different data sets. The goal is to have a different size of data to see the performance trend. We want to see if the data continues to grow, what will be the performance of the system? So we have uh, three data sets which have different scale factors, that's a technical term. And the chart shows the billion rows inside each um, data set. So basically, uh, scale factor 20 means 0.2 billion rows. Scale factor 50 means 0.5 billion rows. And uh, show you the hardware configuration. Here we have four physical nodes. Each is uh, Intel Xeon CPU. There are totally 86 V cores committed to the calculation, and that's 188 gigabytes of memory. Um, both KE and the Spark SQL actually use Spark as a distributed calculation engine. So all the settings on the Spark cluster resource are the same. So I'll list a few of the most important ones here, just for your reference. Okay. Um, now we can see the query response time of each query. Um, so for each data set, we run each query three times and record the average here. So what you are seeing is the average of uh, three runs. There's no warm up because uh, if you know the benchmarks, uh, data system usually needs a warm up to reach stable uh, performance. But here we just count that in. So there's no warm up. What you're seeing here is the result from scale factor 50, so that is 0.5 billion rows behind. And the lower is better that uh, the higher bar means the millisecond that takes for that query to run. Um, the blue ones are Spark SQL. The red ones are KE4. You guys can see most bars KE are below the Spark SQL greatly. And we can sum it up to have a more global view. So let's see three data sets and the, the total response time, which is summing up all the 22 queries. Um, let's see the trend, right? Now again here, the Spark SQL is in gray and the KE4 is in red. So as we compare over the size, we, we see a trend, right? Which, is, does, which makes sense. Uh, like for traditional MPP uh, query engines like Spark SQL, the response time goes up as data goes up. That's a linear relationship. That's simple. And what's interesting is about KE, that line is pretty much flat. It's not real flat. Uh, the scale does not allow you to read, but uh, the scale factor 20, the total response time is about uh, 77 seconds. And when it goes to 50, uh, KE hits uh, 103 seconds. But the difference is much slower as the data grows. That's the point. So this tells what? This tells this technology can scale out as the data grows, right? Because if my data is 10 times as I have today, I don't want to pay 10 times the IT infrastructure cost at that time. So having a relatively flat line is a very good result. Um, and I, I believe this perhaps one of our advantage compared to other similar technology because I know uh, the expo, maybe you walk around, uh, everyone says sub-second latency, um, para PB level data, lightning fast, high concurrency, whatever. Um, but I think the uh, benchmark is very convincing. So when I get this um, chart, I'm pretty confident. So I think we are heading the right direction. Um, another angle is uh, if we have the Spark SQL time divided by the KE time, we have the acceleration rate. So for each query, how much uh, it is accelerated. 
And this chart shows the average acceleration of the 22 queries. And you, as you can see, the uh, linear line compared to the data growing linearly, which says as the data grows, uh, the acceleration rate continues to grow. So it is more and more faster than SparkSQL as data grows. Okay, I don't have too much time. Let's go to the use cases. Um, I would like to wrap up with one use case we had in China, which is China Union Pay. I just uh, mentioned it to you how many cards they have. So they have been exactly in the situation I have introduced. It's uh, pretty mass in their big data design previously because they are not going in the right approach. And we help them to go to the augmented OLAP. So more details. So their scenario is a self-service big data warehouse. So we are talking about uh, 300 billion records for that enterprise. And they want analysts to be able to help to do self-serving, to explore data without too much help from the IT engineers. And uh, the cardinality of their problem, they have merchants is around 10 million. And they have uh, card IDs, as I mentioned, is 10 billion because China has so many people. And the good news, after they adopt to the augmented OLAP approach, they see a much, much greater efficiency in the IT operations. So as a sum up, they used to have 800 Cognos cubes, if you have experience with Cognos. And after adopting the OLAP approach, the system now can see across the whole enterprise that the 800 cubes actually share a similar pattern. So they can be consolidated into one Killingen's model. So that's the approach matters here, I would believe. And most importantly, they see the, ab the ability to scale. That is, they are not only satisfied with today's performance, they are also more confident about their performance in the future as the benchmark shows. So you must be wondering how the 800 Cognos Cube comes from. So I will give you a little bit more details. So basically they do card transaction analysis. And it is done by different teams, just like I mentioned. So there are teams looking from a functional theme, and there are teams looking from a geo theme, and there are teams looking from a time theme, maybe different teams, working on their own mission, own reports, and they do not talk or do not collaborate well too much because of the manual involved, the level of men involved. So it ended up with 800 Cognitive Cube and uh, more than 1,000 ETL jobs. So with some intelligence, it is pretty easy to see that all these queries, all these cubes, they share a common pattern. And uh, we help them to greatly reduce the complexity of their IT infrastructure, the IT assets. It ended up with just one model, which composites of 160, 167 dimensions and 20 measures. So that's their case. Okay. So that's all I have prepared. Thank you for joining. I appreciate your time. If you're interested, if you think you have similar issues and you believe we are heading the right direction, um, you're more than welcome to talk to us. We have homepage, Twitter, and now we have a booth in uh, 1327. Okay, we still have five minutes, right? So I can take a few questions if you have. Yes. Yes, we work with uh, Kerberos, which is a secured Hadoop infrastructure. Yes, we have, uh, on top of that, we have uh, cell level security. If some very big enterprise want that, you can define table, column, and rows accessibility. No. Oh, sorry, that, that, that question was about uh, enterprise level security features. Uh, what, what, what version? The CDH, which version? Ah, CDH version. Uh, what, 
What CDH version do we support? Um, five something is no problem. And we are working on CDH6. I think the next version will support it, which should be in the middle of the year. CDH6 is uh, Hadoop 3.0 uh, core, so it's quite different. Yeah. Yes? How does that approach affect the rate which you can ingest your data? So by moving to one single cube in the pilot and summary thing, mm -hmm. uh, inserting another million lows at the row table or so on. Mm -hmm. How, uh, sorry, I didn't get the questions. So How, the total time it takes to the, from add some data to the queue. OK. Yeah, because you have 800 cubes might have been individually faster, I don't know. Yes. Uh, the question is uh, how, it, how the performance or how fast or capable uh, the system um, adding new cube or new features or new analytic patterns. New data. New data. So there are two angles of it. Um, one is you're adding new piece of data. For example, I'm running daily uh, ETL, right? So that is a daily data incremental load. That's what we call it. That is that uh, it's not changing any model, okay? I'm just on the existing model adding a new day's data. So that performance depends on the amount of data you have daily and the amount of the, the, how big is your cluster to support that level of data. So it's pretty scalable, I would say. Uh, based on the uh, Spark uh, infrastructure. Um, so it's kind of tunable and pretty much manageable. Uh, in practice, incremental data load, we manage to do it under one hour, two hour. Some company usually do uh, night data load, right? A lot of jobs running in the night and uh, people coming in the day to work. Uh, so that's usually not a problem. And the other angle of uh, incremental model change, so that is where the system starts to see new patterns of query. And it, it is the same amount of data, but I'm trying to build in a few more dimensions, building, building a few more measures. So that is another angle of uh, incremental data load. Yeah. Uh, and again, that depends on the amount of uh, incremental you, you, want to, you want to do. Right. Uh, in the example we have just shown, that's uh, seven queries to accelerate in the, live, uh, in the video demo we have shown to do an annual gray growth rate analysis. And uh, uh, as it shows, the seven queries is accelerated in uh, three to four minutes. Right? So that gives you a feeling. But again, uh, it depends on the real amount of uh, new queries and actually the pattern behind them. It does not mean that the, the, the number of query goes on, the pattern goes on. It does not necessarily is a linear, but uh, that, that gives a sense to the question, okay? Yeah, hope I asked, answered your question. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. The thing basically runs on uh, on-premise and in the cloud. So uh, in the cloud, we use the distributed file system. We can use that. Or you can also choose to provision a uh, Hadoop cluster and let us use the HDFS. That's also doable. It depends on the uh, performance you would like to achieve. Uh, so usually, local HDFS is a little bit faster because S3 is the, uh, on the far away of the storage network. Right? Mm. Yes. Okay. Does anyone have any more questions? Or if not, then thank you very much to Yang Li. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for your time.